Stokes. Hit well. Oh, he's there. Stokes has put Southampton in the lead. A great break there for Southampton. And they're all off that Southampton bench. Bobby Stokes. Only five foot seven of him. On the 1st of May, 1976, Jim McCallioch's perfect pass to Bobby Stokes in the FA Cup final enabled Stokes to score the most important goal in the history of Southampton Football Club. Winning the FA Cup for the first time was the high spot for a club that's always been one of the leading advocates for exciting attacking football and true reward for the loyal band of supporters who followed the Saints through the years. Peter Rodriguez, the cup for Southampton. That momentous occasion signalled the start of a period during which the Saints began to establish themselves firmly on the map of top-class football. Blythe, Hugh Fisher the substitute, Bobby Stokes, whose goal was fit to set before a queen. However, they'd already come a long way since those early days when a certain team called Southampton St Mary's arrived on the scene in 1885. They first played on the Common, the County Cricket Ground and the Antelope Ground before moving to the Dell in 1898. From the moment the Mayor of Southampton kicked off that first ball at the Dell, the team celebrated in style by capturing the Southern League title for the third consecutive Despite the bitter disappointment of losing two FA Cup finals at the turn of the century, the Saints continued to establish themselves as a major force to be reckoned with in the Southern League. The 1920-21 season, their first in the Football League, saw them miss out on promotion by one place. However, they soon made amends by winning the Division III South Championship the following season, conceding only 21 goals, a league record which stood for 57 years. The Saints remained in the second division until the outbreak of the Second World War halted the league programme. One saint of distinction during that period was the legendary centre-forward Ted Drake, who had been spotted playing for Winchester City. I'm always happy when, when I know I've got to come down to Southampton, whether I've got to come down and meet my family or, you know. But uh, it's always nice to come back here. Uh, there's always been a saying, I was a little boy, once a saint, always a saint, and I should remain a saint for the rest of my days. I was born in Holyrood, and I served my time at the, the gas company, so I am a real local. If anyone's a local, I am, yes. The Saints team just before the war included many promising youngsters, none more so than a fast-emerging lad named Eddie Bates. Well. Just before the war, it was a little bit difficult. We, Tom Parker didn't have a lot of money. And then, of course, when the war came, it was really a question of trying to keep football going. And we were in all sorts of different leagues and combinations. I mean, we even had different players from different clubs. Uh, it, was, it was mainly a question of keeping football going. And we used to get, still had football followers who wanted to follow it and enjoy it. But for me, of course, it was a, about six years out of my football career, which I, I missed as, as far as football, full-time football was concerned. The return of league football after the war was to spark the beginning of a relatively successful period for Saints, who had players such as Bates, Ellerington, Weber, Rochford, Ramsey, Black, Day and Wayman. Off the field, the manager Bill Dodgin was making a stand against the maximum wage. Southampton guarantee their players with five-year service a £750 cash benefit. Billy Dodgin says... Contented players are the secret of success in any club. Here at Southampton, we do everything possible for the happiness and comfort of the lads. At Southampton, the crowd of over 28,000 were... So disappointment for Saints that season in the Cup and also in the league when they narrowly failed to win promotion. One of the key reasons behind Saints' success at that time was the twin strike force of Eddie Bates and Charlie Wayman. Bill Dodgin got him, and neat, tidy, terrific left foot, could put the ball away from any angle. Quite a very, very popular with the crowd. Up the middle for Charlie was a well-known try here for many, many years. Terrific little player, did a great job for us. 
I know my first game when I went on the field. We played Birmingham and we won one nothing. And the crowd gave me a really great reception. And from then on, they backed me all the way. And I believe you all may have never really enjoyed playing for the team as well as Southampton. A really family setup. And everybody was the best of friends and no troubles. Yeah. The following season, Saints again finished in third place. A bitter blow after seemingly being a shorter promotion as the season drew to a close. I think we were about eight points ahead about Easter and Charlie Wayman was injured and uh, it meant messing the team around a little bit and from then on we didn't get another point and of course we just missed it. Uh, very, very disappointing. It taunt me a lesson, never count your chickens. That's one thing about it. I thought that we were going to be there this year because we've been so near. And when we got to the last eight matches and the papers were saying, who's going up with Southampton? I thought, well, this is it. And uh, we got the, it just went wrong. In the Spurs game, when I pulled me hamstring here and then carried me off and then Bill Dodgen says look we'll put you on back on the field put us back on um, on the left side of the field and Eddie Bates I think was going through with his ball and I, how I got there I don't know I just seemed to be in the middle of the goal and the ball came and I hit the ball Didgeburn Ted Didgeburn pushed it out and with me the bad leg which was I could have had it. I just hit it and it just went in the net and I thought well this is it we're up, we're up now which gave us eight points lead and seven matches to go which everybody is saying well it's, we're there now another member of the Saints team during those days was Eric Weber he had a reputation as a hard stopper centre half did he feel that description was justified Oh, I, see. Yeah, I hope it was because, um, and I hope it, as well as being hard, it was fair. Um, I always went for the ball, uh, determined to play it, and physical contact was part of the game. If, uh, if I had more power than the other fellow physically, well, that was all part of the game. But I wasn't a killer. <laughs> Saints captain and driving influence during that period was Bill Rochford, who was signed from Portsmouth for £550. We learned more as well for Bill than we probably did anybody at that time. Bill was always very, very patient with the younger players and the inexperienced players. But once you had become established as a full-time professional uh, and one who had learnt your trade, if you weren't where he thought you ought to be, you soon heard a few words from him, I can tell you. <laughs> yes, very happy memories. Good family club. Yes, I'd do it all over again. I'd want a little more money this time, mind you. <laughs> Almost unbelievably, the following season, Saints missed out on promotion yet again, this time by the margin of 0 0.065 of a goal. This inevitably signalled the departure of Charlie Wayman. The daunting task of replacing the legendary Wayman in the Saints' attack fell to Eddie Brown, who came in part exchange from Preston North End. There wasn't much else, Charlie. I mean, well, an educated man like yourself, you know, could shell peas with that. Well, I was thought. I tell you what, you could have moved anyway. Go on, you're telling me. Sorry, Eddie, when I was However, Eddie Brown's infectious sense of fun soon won over the Saints' fans. Going down the high street, the second or third night, I see signs like you see Wayman cafe or Charlie Wayman sports uh, and thinking now how the hell do I replace this guy there am I the modest boy from Preston no left foot at all lots of lack of ability could run a little bit possibly so the second day on the track I said uh, right who's the fastest then and for 50p it would probably be 10 bob then I took on one Eric Day who was the speed king up front uh, and uh, modestly, I left the guy for dead. So uh, that did re-establish re a little bit of credulity with the brown boy. But um, uh, George Curtis, uh, have you met George Curtis? 
Is he going to be in this thing at all? Possibly, uh, but a right poser was George, but he was a guy from the Arsenal. Never quite got over the fact that, you know, he had to sink to the depths of Southampton to make a living. But um, uh, great characters, these people. But Ted Bates, at five foot seven, was the only real great guy in the air. And when I say a great guy in the air, he had this Zebedee type uh, jumping with him. Didn't have to run to head the ball, could go up and down, very much like a yo-yo. Ted Bates was a great player. Um, no, Dave Bates, Brown, Curtis and Edwards, uh, not a bad forward line and uh, certainly a few characters. The departure of Eddie Brown and Saints' failure to recapture their form of the late 40s eventually led to relegation for the first time in their history. However, some consolation was achieved that season by reaching the fifth round of the FA Cup, where they met the eventual winners, Blackpool. Blackpool kick off against striped-shirted Southampton at Bloomfield Road. An easy victory over the Saints' is forecast for the Blackpool boys. Now the little wizard himself, Stanley Matthews, gets the ball and sends over a centre. Time and again, Southampton go all out for a quick goal. But the Blackpool defence, led by goalie farm, keeps them from scoring. A forward movement gets the ball to Perry. He has a slam and it's in the Southampton net. There's only five minutes of play left, and it looks like Southampton have had it as far as the Cup's concerned. But from a free kick, centre-half Horton leaps to head and bears the equaliser. Southampton and Blackpool meet again. That season also marked the end of Ted Bates's career as a player, and after two years as reserve team coach, he took over as manager in 1955. I mean, the first deal I ever did for this club was I borrowed, I think, I borrowed a thousand pounds from our supporters club and bought a, a fellow called Jimmy Shields. That was a that was a worst then. And we had a terrific supporters club who would do anything to help us. You know, ladies, gentlemen. George Reader was a chairman at the time. Terry Payne, he came, I mean, he came through the lot. I mean, he came in, in, into us from in the third division. He was so consistent. He was one of these players who could always play the game, get involved with it, and always always get away, not get injured and run into trouble. Very, very consistent, terrific. Chipping, crossing a ball, getting the boy line. Very cute thinker. In those early years, Ted Bates's astute buys and youth development policy soon paid dividends. He built a team capable of winning the Division Three Championship with players like Derek Reeves, who scored 39 league goals that season, still a club record. George O'Brien, John Sydenham, Tommy Mulgrew, and Cliff Huxford, captain of that side, a player who's always had a great respect for the manager who signed him from Chelsea. Number one, Ted knows the game inside out, and uh, the errors he put in at the club were fantastic. And it was very, very pleasing as far as I was concerned that he, he, he got success for Southampton, which he did from the third to second, second to the first. We had a good run in, in the semi-final, to the semi-final of the FA Cup. I believe we won the, the Daily Mirror, as it was in those days, uh, team of the year or whatever. But uh, I can't say enough for uh, Mr Bates. When I meet him now, I still call him boss, uh, which I think speaks how I feel about the man. Manchester United are all in white for their semi-final against Southampton. When the decorations are cleared away, the skipper of United wins the toss. Up goes an enterprising spectator, and 68,000 other fans see the Saints get the game going. Top star of Southampton, Terry Payne, soon shows sparkling form on the right. Early on, he's on the warpath. David Gaskell goes down to save. Obviously, the semi-final was the highlight. I felt the two games against, not, uh, three games against Nottingham Forest. You know, we drew up there, uh, one each. I scored the goal there. Uh, we had an incredible return match where we were three goals down with 14 uh, minutes to go and managed to come back three each. And then uh, we uh, went to White Hart Lane for the third game and beat them. I think it was 5-1. Um, remember, we were second division and they were first division. 
you know, I mean, you get so near uh, and so close to actually going to a final. Uh, obviously, we were broken hearted and there was a few tears shed, including mine. For United, a well-placed centre. Dennis Law just manages to connect. Goal! United centre forward David Hurd taxis Reynolds, and this time Southampton are fortunate to escape. In a last despairing attempt, the Saints are on the move, only to find Gaskell unperturbed. Well, uh, this is the worst day of my life, without any uh, shadow of doubt. It was, uh, it wasn't a good experience at all. Um, to be so close, 62-63 uh, was the year of the big freeze and uh, we played our games very close together because there had been about a three-month layoff at that time. It's hard to believe with the winters we're getting now, but um, we had such a long break that um, all of the, we were playing a, a cup game on a Saturday, a Wednesday, a Saturday, and um, before we knew where we were, we were in the semi-finals. So it just seemed as though it was meant to be our year that year. Unfortunately, the game itself um, it wasn't a good game. Uh, both teams played badly. Either team could have won it. Uh, and it was just a, a simple goalkeeping error on the day and Dennis Law standing on the line. He just hit him on the knee and went in. And That's football, I guess. That's the way it went. Heartbreaking so, for you. Heartbreaking. Bobby Smith kicks off for England in the international against Ireland at Wembley. This is the brilliant New England. From the foot of Terry Payne comes England's first goal. Terry Payne again. He gets the fourth goal. Hat trick for Terry Payne. Another player destined to become an England international, Martin Chivers, was at that time just beginning to establish himself in the Saints forward line. All I wanted to do was score goals. So, and uh, I remember first goal was when we played away at uh, Swindon. The team was having a bad time and uh, I happened to score the winning goal. Uh, I'm very heavy ground. I think the first goal you remember, I don't remember many of the others. It's quite a while back now, but uh, certainly to, to finish level goal scorer with Terry was, uh, it spoke for itself. It was a good first season for me. As fate would have it, the third round draw of the FA Cup paired Saints at home to Manchester United, the team that had knocked them out in the semi-final the previous season. Thanks to some dazzling wing play from Terry Payne and centre forward George Kirby's usual robust determination, Saints looked like taking immediate revenge as they dominated the first half against their Division I opponents and stormed into a 2-0 lead by half-time. Here we see Saints' first goal from Martin Chivers, a tremendous strike from outside the box, giving the United keeper no chance. In the second half, United hit back, but for a time, Saints keeper Tony Godfrey kept them at bay. However, unable to maintain their form of the first half, they eventually went down 3-2, conceding a horrendous own goal by fullback Tommy Trainer. Despite battling for an equaliser in the dying minutes, the ball just wouldn't go in the net, signalling a sad and sorry early exit for the Saints from the competition. Making his name as a goal scorer of the highest calibre for Saints at that time was the Scot, George O'Brien. George was always sharp, a little, bit, a little bit of a lazy player, but he was always sharp in the box. He used to pick up passes from Terry Payne, difficult angles, get onto them, pop them away. George used to like to do, the work, do his work in the 18-yard area. Our opponents, not ours. <laughs> nice and encourage him. Terrific finisher. Terrific player for this club, George O'Brien. Saints continued to move from strength to strength and at last won promotion to Division I in the 65-66 season. A point against the bottom club, Lake Orient, was all they needed to secure promotion. What was it worth financially to the players in those days? 
when they've, when they've completed a number of games for us, they get paid accordingly uh, to balance off the games that they've played. And uh, some of them that have been in through the season will get close on a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds? Yes, yes. Which is a, which proves to the people that say that they don't want to get out of the, of the second division. Well, you've proved that tonight. And what do you think of your chances for next season? A good side can hold their own in any company. I'm particularly pleased, of course, to uh, the directors. It backs up all the hard work that they put in. But generally, it's quite a oh, it's quite a day for the club. Well, no about that. Marvellous, Ted. Thanks very much, and we'll try and have a chat now to the captain, Tony Nat. I week. think we'll be a better side in the first division because I think we'll have plenty of time in which to play our football. Yeah, no no more slip this next season. Oh, not no, no, I hope not. <laughs> okay, Tony. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Pretty much the man of the match, scoring the goal that got Southampton into the first division. How does it feel to do something like this? Well, you say the man of the match. I think it was a great team effort, you know. Um, I scored the goal, but there's, you know, plenty of others who've scored them during the season. They all count. Well, it was a rare occasion, really, because I scored with a header. I didn't get many of those in my career, but that, that in fact made it one each. And although to be absolutely truthful, even after the game, it wasn't guaranteed that we were going to get promotion because as you realise, we had to go to Manchester City. As long as we didn't lose 6-0, we were, we were uh, promoted. And I remember Ted Bates in particular in the, um, in the dressing room after the game, we were all celebrating, champagne was flowing, etc. And he refused to celebrate. He said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll celebrate after the Manchester City game. Absolutely unforgettable. Um, again, I don't think um, most people, probably in Southampton, really believe that Southampton would, were going to be a first division club. They always used to talk about the old days. I believe there was a time when the club were about 10 points clear with just a few games to go and they, they missed out and everybody say, oh, the club don't really want to get there. And so we had this all the time. and. Um, uh, the end of it was, uh, we really clinched it at uh, Lunt. Um, and as far as we were, were all concerned, I know as far as Ted Bates was concerned, it wasn't over. The, the whole town was celebrating. But we had that agonising ten days to wait. And uh, being professional players, we obviously um, realise anything can happen in the game. So I think we were just happy to get that over and out of the way. It was, uh, yeah, it was a great time, great time. The city was really bubbling. Bates' first signing for Saints in Division 1 was Ron Davis. During his first season, Big Ron teamed up with Martin Chivers, and between them they scored 61 goals. He was a tremendous player with his head, and uh, obviously for me, I was a big man as well, and we, we were perfect for, for one another. They couldn't mark both of us. If it wasn't me one day, it was him. Uh, I think you'll find that the majority of the goals were scored by Ron, but uh, 61 goals, as you say, between two players, two strikers, is... Uh, a wonderful achievement but if you look at all those goals you can look at John you can, you can thank John Sidenham and Terry Payne once again because they gave, they gave the service from the sides if you've got somebody who's a bit telepathic with you uh, it's very easy to score goals or makes it easier to score goals Toward Davis and on the goal he's done it Davis has done it this time Ron Davis the scorer and with John, John had the exceptional speed, which uh, Terry certainly didn't, he would admit he didn't have that. And so it was a, the electrifying burst down the wing, and I knew that uh, I was going to get good service from that side as well. Very different wingers, but uh, equally as good in their own right. In fact, uh, I think John could have uh, probably done better if he'd had the breaks. One of the goals conceded in that match was scored by the Blackpool midfielder, Hugh Fisher. Good Blackpool side that, some, some excellent players, although we got relegated that year. Um, unfortunately, uh, the old fox Ted Bates must have watched me closely that game because uh, I think I did play reasonably well on the day. And it wasn't long after that that, that I signed for, for Southampton. And it wasn't long before he was scoring some spectacular goals for Saints, like this one against West Bromwich. Great characters, great characters. Oh, as a great admiration for Jimmy Gable, I think he was... In my mind, Jimmy was an excellent professional and led by example on the pitch. Never knew the meaning of the word defeat. And what about in the middle of the defence here, big John McGrath? <laughs> John McGrath, yeah, I've had some great stories about John. Uh, I think a reporter once mentioned in Burnley when he cleared that uh, 
and it was in the front page of the paper that night that the ball landed in Clitheroe, and Clitheroe is supposed to be 20 miles from Burnley, so that tends to say son of a big John. He wasn't the best passer in the world, but again, a, an excellent defender. Mick Shannon's emergence at that time softened the blur of Chivers' departure to Tottenham for a record fee. How did Shannon find the atmosphere in those early days? We were always a team that were a little bit carefree. You know, that, that lovely sort of, let's get, let's get out there, let's have a goal, let's try and score a goal. If we get beat, so what, we go, you know, we go to the pub and have a drink. You know, it was, it was like a, a village sort of, uh, that sort of community. And although it was Southampton Football Club, Southampton Football Club was about the, the communities that used to come in, you know. I mean, there's a, there a big area, a big, lot of farming people and country people used to love to go to Southampton Football Club because the football was good. Saints continued to establish themselves in the first division thanks to significant contributions from players like Dennis Hollywood, Jerry O'Brien, Joe Kirkup, Brian O'Neill and of course that great goal scorer Ron Davis. with the free kick. Now will he find Ron Davis's head? Yes, he does. Shannon can't get to it, but Davis is shot! And a beautiful save. Davis astounded, and well, he might be. And O'Brien. Jenkins. And it's beaten him off the post! Extraordinary shot from Jenkins that Stepney couldn't touch, came down off the bar. And Davis couldn't get there. Kids cross for Law's head, and he's found it. Best jumps over it. Charlton! No satisfaction for Payne in having the ball placed for him. Davis coming at the far post with a great header. Miles above them all. Shannon. Payne's free kick, and Davis there, and Gabriel! Jimmy Gabriel, the scorer, the goal made for him by, by Davis's header. Sadly, the following season saw the departure of Jimmy Gabriel and Ron Davis, signalling the end of an era at the Dell. After a successful start to the 1973-74 campaign, Ted Bates decided that the time was right to hand over full control of team affairs to Laurie McMenemy. It was also to be Terry Payne's last season with the Saints. Well, it was a great disappointment. I mean, I remember that year in particular, we, about Christmas, we were either fifth or sixth. Um, then things started to change at Southampton Football Club. Ted Bates took a back seat, Laurie McMenemy came to the fore, and um, I think possibly tried to change things a little bit too quick and too soon, and consequently we got relegated that year, and uh, really that was my swan song. As I said, things were beginning to change. Obviously, Laurie wanted uh, uh, people around him that he'd been with before, and one can always understand that. A new broom, you know, wants to sweep clean. And we were certainly the old guy there. But obviously, to leave Southampton was a big wrench. I mean, you don't spend all your football life at, at one club and, and to have done what we've done under what I consider the best manager alongside John Sillett I'll ever work with. Uh, Ted Bates had, had that knack. I mean, he'd built the team from the third division, got us all the way through to the first, into Europe. And obviously, you know, I've got a lot of time in my heart for Ted Bates and Southampton Football Club in general. So McMenemy's first season saw Saints relegated, becoming the first victims of the new three-up, three-down rule. Laurie came, took over and got stuck into it. It's, sometimes it's difficult to explain these things that happen in football. Maybe it was his over-enthusiasm. He wanted to get cracking, you know, and, and you get to... I mean, he's a complete different contrast to me. But, uh, no, it was just something that... that we had to get on with. You know, it was, I mean, lots of clubs would have probably panicked. But the great thing about this club, we didn't. And it probably helped to make Laurie the manager that he became. One of Laurie McMenemy's early signings was Peter Osgood. What did he think of his new teammates? It, it was a good side, it was a good balance side. That was the, the thing that Laurie got together, was it was a good balance side. He got, uh, I mean, he brought Peter Rodriguez down here from uh, Leicester on a free transfer and made him captain and, uh, I mean, it was a great signing for us. Rodriguez. Shannon. 
Trying to take it off hand. Gets it across. Oh! One of the highlights of those early days back in the second division was a 4 0 thrashing of their local rivals, Portsmouth. Mick Shannon scored two of the goals. And it's a good one. There's the header on the far post. And it's there. But all I can say is that uh, it was probably the best move I ever did in my life. I never regret it. The great people down here. I live down here now. And um, it was probably yeah, thanks to Laurie, really, for selling me the club. But uh, once I got down here, the club sold itself, and uh, they are tremendous people. And uh, it was a pleasure to play for them for five years. The following season saw things steadily begin to improve. And in the third round of the FA Cup, thanks to a last-minute goal by Hugh Fisher, Saints began their march towards Wembley. The semi-final saw them paired with Crystal Oscar. Palace. Gilchrist, it well, goal! Hammond, 2-0! You know, Paul Gilchrist shot, and I tell you what, it touched my sock on the way by. So I want that credited to me, seriously, but it did. I mean, if you ever see the video, it just brushed my sock as it went by. And it was from about 35 yards. Remember Paul Gilchrist? And then I was brought down for a penalty, and not that I'm not claiming the first Paul could have it, it doesn't matter. But I'm saying it did touch my sock. So the big day finally arrived, and with victories over Aston Villa, Blackpool, West Bromwich Albion, Bradford City, and Crystal Palace behind them, Saints now had to overcome the might of Tommy Doherty's Manchester United of the First Division in the final. I think it was the build-up was a lot of waiting. Uh, we had to sit in the change rooms waiting for the little man to come in to tell us to line up in the tunnel. Then we stood in the tunnel, the little man come along and said we could walk onto the park. And all in all, all I wanted to do was get out and play. We stood up to be presented and it seemed ages that we just stood there and all you could see was mass colours. No faces, it was just colours everywhere. I think that was all I can remember really of before the game. The game itself, the first quarter of an hour, I didn't realise how bad I'd played till I watched it on video. And it bounced off me. Wherever it touched me, it bounced. But Pat Jennings used to say, it didn't matter what you used as long as you kept it out. And so I still tell people that was all I was interested in. Long ball there. This time, Houston would have been onside. Kaliox had a goal away. Now it comes to Pearson. Played on the game for Hill. Onside, he's all right. Is this number one? No, pushed away there by Turner. Well, that was one occasion when the offside didn't work. Osgood. Probably the first time in my career it, that I thought myself, w is the game, you know, I mean, the whole thing about Southampton Football Club has been this, let's get out and let's score goals and go forward and enjoy the football and the crowd will enjoy it and we'll all, we'll all have a great time. But it was the first time that I really I thought to myself, it's more important to win than anything, you know? And I think the semi-final and the final were probably two of the worst games of my life, you know? I, I mean, I didn't really enjoy them. But I mean, who remembers the second in a cup final? Nobody. Everyone remembers the winners, don't they? It's McCallyog now for Southampton. A long ball forward. Exactly right for Shannon. Oh, and he very nearly made it. Mike Shannon there. He cannot believe that that didn't go to the back of the net. Do you know, it's, it's strange, isn't it? I was only a kid at the time, and uh, everything is a bit uh, vague. I've watched the final once uh, since then, and uh, there's, there's so much happened there that I, I just didn't realise and uh, I was too young to really appreciate it, I must admit. It's Southampton in the lead! A great break there for Southampton, and they're all off that Southampton bench. Bobby Stokes, only five foot seven of him. I'll always talk about it, but I'll never bring it up. Really? 
well, I mean, it's water under the bridge. It's a nice memory within me, and uh, especially for my family. But uh, on the day, I suppose it was part of my job, or Ozzy's job, or Mick Shannon's job. We had to go out there and try and win, and fortunately, uh, I got the goal. A half a minute of injury time already played. And they've done it! Southampton have won it! Bobby Stokes' his goal has done it! And Mike Shannon and Bobby Stokes, and look at those scenes of joy! Ian Turner, who was in trouble early on, but survived it all. Mel Blythe, the big number five, and the number two, the skipper Peter Rodriguez on a free transfer a year ago. Superb scenes of great excitement for Southampton. I still look at the end of the cup final, look at the captain going up, and it's just that grabbing hold of the cup from whoever's presenting it to you, turning to your supporters, and you raise 40,000 voices just by lifting that cup. And that was the proudest day of my life. And even now, I sort of little shiver when I see it on TV still, you know. And receiving it from the Queen. Peter Rodriguez, the cup for Southampton. I do believe in God, and he said, uh, give the lad a little little treat before he retires, and I, I believe he did it for me, you know, help with Laurie and the rest of the guys, uh, to make me finish my career off on a high note, which it did, absolutely, 100%. I couldn't believe how many people were sort of around Southampton. The town had never seen anything like it, or the city had never seen anything like it. And I sat with the big man, big lorry at the back. Uh, I, I was on my own, there were the wives and girlfriends, or wives and girlfriends, some of them had, I think. I think they smuggled them on as well. But uh, I sat with Laurie, and all we did, he said, come here. And he had six bottles of champagne underneath the uh, seat. And it was a great emotional time, and, and I just sat back and enjoyed it. It was really fantastic. He was a character. He was a great character. He won the cup final for us. He, for me, he was man of the match by a long way. He was brilliant. You don't find him like that these days. <laughs> yeah, Jim Steele. With the memory of the FA Cup triumphs safely locked away, Saints got down to the serious business of trying to get back to Division One. The 76-77 campaign began badly, and after seven matches, Saints were bottom of Division Two without a win. Then Ted McDougall was signed, and Fulham visited the Dell. Blythe's made an early run forward. Will it come to Mel Blythe? It will! Well, that could be the one that wraps it up for Southampton. And Blythe is in there! McDougall is onside. Ted McDougall in with a great chance for number four. And there it is.
In January of that same season, Laurie McMenemy bought Alan Ball, one of the club's best ever signings. Well, I think they were fifth or sixth bottom when I joined, just before Christmas, and they hadn't had a, a start at all to the season. Um, we got the team cracking, and uh, towards the end, we had a slight chance of going up. I think we finished about eighth that year. So uh, I think the signs were good for the following year, but within the club, they'd had, they'd had a bad start for one reason or another. During that season, the cup holders Saints reached the fifth round of the FA Cup against their old adversaries, Manchester United. Alan Ball leading out a side containing only five of the previous season's Wembley team. Eventually going down 2-1 in a replay at Old Trafford, Saints first battled to an exciting two-all draw at the Dell. Waldron getting that one away. Ball getting that one away. Shannon's onside. Now, can Shannon get the equaliser here? All the way round. Waldron who got it away. Nickel returning it first time. Pearson playing it wide. Crossed it along the goal and it's there. Well, Hill whacked that one in when Southampton least expected it. Here's Ball. Williams. Ball again. Nice touch here for Shannon. No. Oh, but here's Shannon again. And they've got men up this time. All oh, Holmes right through. And he's equalised. Two goals. Williams, nice skill. Very nice skill. Shannon. It's a good move this by Southampton. A brilliant move by Southampton. And a marvellous save by Stephanie. up, playing it in higher this time towards Peter Osgood and McDougall and just move on. Another look at the watch. He's played uh, one minute of injury time, but there have been uh, one or two knocks and stoppages in this second half. Peach, and now Osgood, and away goes Mick Shannon. It might not be all over yet, and Stephanie right out there. Shannon, another of those exhilarating runs. In the summer of 1977, Mick Shannon left the Saints to try his luck with Manchester City. I mean, really, what was I going to do? I mean, I could have knocked around another few years, and but well, you've got to get up and have a go. And I thought, well, let's go and have a go now for a few years. And uh, probably, what, I mean, it was probably a disaster. I mean, I went to Man City and couldn't kick me backside, so... Perhaps I should have stayed. But when I came back, I had three three great years there for you know before the end, not before the end of me, before you know before the end of Southampton really. <laughs> Despite the departure of Mick Shannon, Saints at last won promotion back to Division One, finishing runners-up at the end of the 77-78 season. Saints' first season back in Division One will best be remembered for their second visit to Wembley in three years, this time in the League Cup final against Brown Clough's Nottingham Forest. The team included the Yugoslav international Ivan Golats and little Austin Hayes, whose life was to be tragically cut short by cancer in 1986. Chris Nicol, Terry Curran and the little substitute there, Tony Seeley. The match was only 15 minutes old when Saints got off to the perfect start with a quality goal. Yes, to Boyer. Holmes in behind him. Missed the pass for Nick Holmes. Boyer again. Peach waiting for it now. Peach getting it. Right foot perhaps. No. Alan Ball. Played in there. Now for Peach. And a goal. Peach. Here he is, Peach who started it. Played in here for Alan Ball. It was a 1-2. Uh, ball came into me and Peachy made the third man run. He was on his bike. And uh, that was my game. 
helping balls on, playing one-touch football all over the pitch. And uh, it was a typical Southampton football in flowing move, really, which concerned me. Uh, people who have played with me over the years at Southampton knew that when the ball was coming to me, they were going to get it as quickly as possible. If I could have taken half a touch, I would. And it was just one of those simple, what I call simple goals, where people are on the run and it's up to me to get the ball to them. But then Peachy did the hard bit, putting the ball in the back of the net. It was a good, good finish. We're into time added on for stoppages as the half-time whistle goes, with Southampton leading through the goal by David Peach. Beautifully worked by him, but it wasn't only Peach's goal scoring, it was his defence as well. We are leading at half-time and uh, Forrest hadn't had a kick hardly. Uh, I haven't good memories of that game because I didn't play particularly well during the second half. Um, we lost some goals um, and I, I should have done better. Uh, but it was, a, it was a great run and I enjoyed it very much. Um, and we, it was a Wembley appearance again, another Wembley appearance for Southampton, which was terrific. And Forrest looking a little more aggressive in the second half. Here's Robertson now. Can he get a shot in? Oh. And a goal there! Yeah. Oh. Well, Berkles got a chance he should never have been allowed. Barrett. Now Berkles! Going all the way, Berkles! Woodcock and another one, Tony Woodcock. Williams. Walton right in there and Curran in here. Oh, and a great goal by Nick Holmes. Well, get back, he says. Let's get back to the centre and get started again because maybe the whole thing's been opened up once more. I scored a good goal, which made a change. Um, unfortunately, we lost on the day. I mean, but uh, obviously scoring against Shilton is uh, something a bit special. I did it a few times in training after that, but that one meant a bit more, I must admit. Tremendously struck left foot shot there by Nick Holmes. And look at the way that sweetly comes off his left foot. Shilton, in fact, just gets a minor touch. It was a bit of a skirmish in the goal, and Nick came on and, and it sort of an unstoppable shot, really, right in the corner of the net, and that made it 3-2 with a few minutes to go. And the one thing I do remember is that, that they had a breakaway just after that, and I remember racing out just towards the edge of the box and just managing to get there before uh, one of the Southampton players. And, and I felt I'd, I'd read the situation quite well, and it wasn't a bad save, although it wasn't spectacular. But uh, from being winning the final comfortably, um, it was a bit of a struggle in the end. But fortunately for, for us, anyway, we, we managed to uh, hold on. Now Paul played on. Boyer's after it. Shilton's out. And Shilton gets it right on the edge of the box. That hadn't had been hit quite as firmly if Boyer had been... Well, he was quick enough off the mark. If Shilton maybe hadn't been quite so quick to spot the danger, who knows? And Alan Ball comes forward. If I've got any, you know, axe to grind, it was my own performance second half. I didn't play quite as well as I did first half. Um, but it was a great day. I thought it was one of the best finals that people could see. And it was a typical Southampton performance, really. Uh, entertaining people, playing football, scoring goals. The following season, Charlie George made his long-awaited debut, joining the experienced forward Phil Boyer in a team boosted by the return of Mick Shannon from Manchester City. Phil Boyer, he was a neat, tidy player, good professional, worked hard. Um, never scored goals until he started playing up front, really. He, st he started playing more or less in the Ted McDougall role, because Ted, Ted was there, remember? He was a character, boy. We had, some, we had some rows with him and some fights with him, but he was he was... Great goal scorer, great goal scorer. Um, Phil Boyer, yeah, I mean, neat, tidy player. And he scored 20, he was top scorer almost, when in the first division. A good player, good player. We had some good players. Charlie George, brilliant, brilliant skills, brilliant.
pass of the ball. He was never fit, though, Charlie, was he? If he was Norse, you'd shoot him, wouldn't you? <laughs> in November 1979, when Charlie George was indeed absent through injury, Saints took on Nottingham Forest at the Dell, a chance to avenge the League Cup final defeat. Holmes and Watson. Oh, yes! What a lovely goal! What a super move! Baker. Oh, my goodness, that came off Burns. And Forrester just in tatters. Yes, and Shannon's made it! Towards the end of this season, the city of Southampton was set alight with the announcement that Kevin Keegan would be joining the club at the start of the following season. This led to a period of some of the most exciting football ever seen at the Dell. Massive kick there by Katalinic. Keegan turning it on. Bran! One more! Straight to our ball. And Horan is on his way again. Getting in behind the once more with all the pace in the world as he got the finishing as well. Keegan has! And here's Williams. Played in for Shannon. A little touch here for Ball. And the cross in once more. Armstrong was right there. Keegan is there. Oh! Disallowed, offside against David Armstrong. Ball, Keegan's off again. Taking on between this time. Little dummy, about a yard of space. Shannon looking to be able to turn. And denying him, Shannon almost got the turn in. Armstrong doing it all the way. Keegan. Ball, Baker. Keegan, Armstrong, Keegan, Shannon! You won't see a better goal than that this season! That was marvellous! That was a good goal. Yeah, that was a good goal. Um, with my left foot as well. Yeah, that was quite... I, I remember that building up and... Uh, that's right. I've, that was a good game though, wasn't it? It was a good game that. Like, you know, we lost through it. I don't, I don't, I only remember the goal, I don't remember getting beat. <laughs> Keegan. Ah, uh, Purcells to ball. Purcells again. Keegan. Ball. Baker. Keegan. Armstrong. Keegan. Shannon. You won't see a better goal than that. Fittingly, that goal of the season was Mick Shannon's last ever goal for Saints before finally moving on. I've got no regrets at all. I mean, and uh, I mean, I think that uh, I mean, if you're a professional, you got to you got to realise that you go into the game, um, and basically they're going to use you until you're no good to them. And uh, I was, I, I mean, I think that possibly I would have been there a bit longer, but I was on a, a large wage. They could probably get two or three young players in, and I was getting on then. I was 30. 33, 34, I was basically, you know, I was on the glass mountain, you know, and the grappling hooks weren't, weren't biting either, I kept trying and, and I was sliding. So they probably made the right decision, kicked my ass out of it. Steve Moran was one of the young players who'd benefited enormously from playing alongside the likes of Mick Shannon and Kevin Keegan. I wasn't sort of getting involved in the team play very much in, in that, uh, those early years, but I just seemed to be, able to be in the right place at the right time and seemed to be able to stick the goals away. Uh, due a lot to um, great through balls from the older sort of father figures sort of playing alongside us. Tegan and Moran is allowed to go on and could finish it here and does. As Steve Moran celebrates a goal in the 88th minute. 
Midway through this season, Saints went to the top of Division 1 for the first time in their history and stayed there for longer than any other team during that campaign. It was, it was over the period when we had a really bad winter. A lot of games were called off. I think we'd just beaten Liverpool 1-0 away at, at Tanfield. I think I scored in the, in the final minute in that game. Um, we, we drew at Everton 1-1 and I was having bad problems. Uh, we'd, been, we'd had x-rays on my back and found out that I'd broken a couple of bones and subsequently um, had to have an operation. I was out for nine months. Tried to keep it a secret from the rest of the lads because, like you say, at that time we were top of the league and, you know, we didn't want to sort of um, destroy the, the momentum. But obviously it, it, it got out and unfortunately we didn't stay there till the end, end of the season. That season saw the debut of Mark Wright, who went on to gain international honours alongside Laurie McMenemy's latest exciting signing from Nottingham Forest, the England goalkeeper Peter Shilton. Older Saints fans will have a lasting memory of Shilton dating back to 1967. It was, I think it was in the last few minutes of the match and we were about 4-1 up. And I just got the ball and smacked it down the middle and it landed more or less on the edge of the box and it bounced but skidded and the wind took it and it took off and went over his head and, and bounced in the net. And the, the goalkeeper of Southampton, Campbell Forsyth, I felt very sorry for him actually. Um, not at the time because I didn't realise I'd scored. I thought that Mike Stringfellow had knocked it in. Um, but that, the lads were taking the mickey and saying, well, you know, you scored. And I thought, no, no, you know, I couldn't have done it. I got home and saw it on the TV, on the video, and uh, suddenly realised I had. But I don't take any satisfaction from it because I know how I'd feel if it happened to me being a goalkeeper. I mean, it's just a complete fluke and uh, the conditions added to it. But, you know, at least, at least I could say I've scored anyway. So, um, you know, not from the penalty spot or a header. It's, uh, it's, it's a goal that I'll probably always remember. However, McMenemy hadn't signed Shilton for his goal-scoring ability, but for his truly outstanding goal-keeping. This time further away, and Shilton, an incredible save from Kiedelwitz, who is very involved in this game. He's a most competitive little player, Steve. And here's Wid with another header, and again it's Shilton just flicking it off Wid's toe, and Peter Wid gives him a respecting tap on the back of the head. With crossed by Hurd, Paul he didn't quite get there. Hurd, what a great shot and what a great save! Kevin Keegan left and Mick Shannon uh, had already left. He'd, he'd been released and it just left Alan Ball. And I think after about five or six games, Alan retired. He felt he'd had enough. So all of a sudden, from being a team of names, it was a team of unknown names really. I mean, it was it was a lot of youngsters and it was a bit of a struggle. It was a bad start to the season. We, we weren't a very good side and um, uh, it was sort of halfway through the season really before we, we started to, um, to put a few results together. Williams and Armstrong in the middle if he can cross. Oh, Williams, Williams the scorer with a beautiful flicked header. Steve Williams putting Southampton in front with a very good goal. Pops. Pick on by Wallace. Corrigan out, but not in time. And Moran has made it 2-0. Nickel. And that's gone through for Moran. Corrigan backpedalling. Moran can't work it through the wet. And he's forced to dribble out. And there it goes in from Puckett. Strong, pocket, Moran in the middle, Holmes arriving too, here's Holmes, made himself some room, can he curl one? Yes he can! Nice little check that made him the room, took his time, and with great deliberation in under the crossbar. Another of the Saints emerging young stars at that time was Danny Wallace. Falls in for Wallace. Brilliant goal. And with nine minutes to go, Southampton are in front. Two goals to one. And Danny Wallace with his 12th goal of the season. Hitting it from outside the area. On the volley. What a goal. 
The following season, Frank Worthington arrived and immediately slotted in to an ever-improving Saints side. Uh, I remember I didn't score too many goals for uh, the Saints, but uh, I, was, uh, I think I was quite important in, in, uh, in the way that I was used in the team. I was the main, uh, the main target for, uh, for the back players to hit. And, uh, uh, with little Danny Wallace and Steve Moran either side of me just looking to, uh, you know, to feed off me. And it, it worked very, very well. In April 1984, Saints travelled to Highbury to take on Everton in the semi-finals of the FA Cup. Despite dominating the first half, Saints just couldn't score. Wright is in there again as Dennis plants it in once more. Right with the header, Worthington onto the left boot! Wallace now for Southampton. Oh, good break by him. And across the goal, Worthington down and nodded over the top by Steve Moran, but the flag was up. And the closest we've come, nonetheless, to having the ball in the net. Armstrong. Oh, it comes for Wallace. And a great save by Southall. With good support from his defence. Uh, tremendous disappointment, yeah, because uh, Stevie Williams, uh, he wasn't really fit and Laurie decided to uh, to play him, which uh, we all thought was fine, but, uh, you know, the, the gamble didn't really pay off and uh, at half-time, I myself, I would have thought uh, we might have made a change because I've, I've honestly felt that if we'd have had 11 fit players out there over 90 minutes, we uh, would have got to Wembley. All right. Really buzzed yet, but now might get the opportunity. No, because Armstrong is there. Did it well. Williams. Oh, he certainly hit better balls than that this season. Fuller. Dennis, the long ball forward. Wallace was just about on side. There wasn't much in it. But what about that for pace? And uh, well, the Southall just got a fingertip to it. And that goes down as a very good save indeed after a brilliant run by Danny Wallace. He outstripped Bailey, just got the touch there, which was enough to put it wide of the post. Mills made in short for Worthington. All the tricks, a little touch there, right on the far side. And behind now for the goal kick. With about three minutes of extra time remaining, a little chip will be coming now from Peter Reid. Sharp, Mountfield, Gray, Heath are all in there. It's Mountfield, and it's Heath! They scored three minutes from the end of extra time, and, and I was looking forward to a replay. I thought, well, we've not done it this time, but we're gonna get, we'll have a good chance next time. And I remember it was a free kick out wide and it was played into the, the, uh, the area at Arsenal and the goal mouth was very sandy. And as it came across the box, I think it sort of, as it hit the, uh, the goal mouth, it sort of popped up because of the sand and it just made it uh, a nice height for, I think it was Adrian Heath, to get his head to. And um, it just sort of went straight into the top corner. And if it hadn't probably been for the sandy goal, he probably might not have been able to have scored. But that, that's, that's, that's the look you need, I think, when you, uh, when you win a trophy. So, bit of disappointment for Southampton in the FA Cup. However, compensation was achieved in the league when they went to Notts County for the last match of the 83-84 season, where two goals from Steve Moran and one from David Armstrong secured a 3-1 victory. This meant that Saints finished runners-up behind Liverpool, their highest ever league position in the club's 99-year history. Yeah, it was, it was a super team to play in. We had uh, a lot of strengths. Uh, Mark Wright was superb in defence. Ruben Abgoula, uh, Nick Jones. Uh, Laurie brought Mark Dennis down from, uh, from Birmingham, actually, and um, uh, he did tremendously well top-class left-back and, uh, and we had a nice balance throughout the team. Stevie Williams in the midfield, David Armstrong and we were a very strong uh, all-round outfit. 
Towards the end of 1984, the Young Footballer of the Year, Mark Wright, was one of the players involved in several public disagreements with Lorimer Menemy, thus tarnishing a season in which Saints finished fifth in Division One. A lot of space here for Williams, and what a very good goal he scored too! In particular, the departure of Steve Williams to Arsenal surprised and upset many Saints fans, as he'd been with Southampton since his school days and was regarded as important to the club's future. Williams was sorely missed on the pitch, and McMenemy soon bought Jimmy Case from Brighton, which proved to be his very last signing as manager of Southampton Football Club. Lottie McMenemy himself, uh, uh, he asked just to speak to me at first, but it only took me uh, part of the afternoon, then I was, I was signed. Um, he was very persuasive, but obviously the club itself uh, in the first division at the time and, and Brighton were just below them in the second division. Uh, it was always, I mean, it's the only, only place to play in the first division. And he said he wanted somebody to uh, go straight into the dressing room and not be overawed by the players such as Shilton, Mills and this type of thing. And Steve Williams had just left at the time. So uh, I come straight into the side and uh, for the last 10 games of that season, and uh, then it was just at the airport on the way home from Trinidad, he says uh, he was leaving. So uh, it left me a little bit in the lurch because uh, obviously he gets signed by a manager and then you, know, you don't know who, who the next one will be, but you just try your best and, and that's the way, that was the outcome. Laurie McMenemy resigned from Southampton during the summer of 1985 to move back to his native northeast as manager of Sunderland. After much deliberation, Saints chairman, the late Alan Woodford, announced to the waiting supporters that the new manager was to be the club's former centre-half Chris Nicholl, returning to the Dell after a spell as player assistant manager with Grimsby Town. The first I knew that uh, Southampton uh, wanted to talk to me was uh, Mr Bates, Ted Bates. The, the previous manager to Larry Mac. Uh, came to have a chat with me and we had a good talk. I always got on very well with, the, with all the directors and Ted Bates. Um, at the time I had no experience apart from uh, assistant manager player at Grimsby Town and I left here to go and do that job and I had two years with Grimsby Town as a player and uh, also assisting the manager there. So that's very limited experience to come and manage a first division club against the best in the country. Um, and so it proved that there was a difficult time since. But uh, the job is tough wherever you are. But uh, I was very proud to be asked. Um, I knew all the people here. I knew, uh, having played here six years and, and enjoyed a terrific amount of success, then they, I was happy to come back. My family still loved the area and had many friends from here. I uh, hope she still got them. <laughs> I mean, I knew Chris as, as a player here when, when Laurie was manager, and uh, Chris is really a mixture of the two, and I'm sure that uh, with Ted still being connected with the club, um, Chris would have worked in previous years with people like Alex Stock, who was very similar to Ted, very thorough in, in, in analysing games and uh, in tactics, um, but at the same time, things of, which I mentioned about Laurie, motivation, um, had rubbed off on, on Chris as well. Um, I find him a very, very thorough and uh, conscientious manager and a, a, a man of vast experience in, in, in playing for the Southampton, playing with many other clubs. And we all learn when we go to other clubs certain things. We learn good and bad. And he's brought those good points uh, to the club. Uh, a most conscientious manager. During Chris Nichols' first season in charge, Saints embarked on another successful FA Cup run with a third round away win over Middlesbrough, Danny Wallace netting a hat-trick. Further victories over Wigan and Millwall after a replay soon had Saints fans believing that their new manager was going to steer the club all the way to Wembley. When the sixth round draw paired Saints with their local South Coast rivals Brighton, no player relished the prospect of that tie more than Jimmy Case, the former Brighton favourite. Saints clinched their place in the last four with a win over Brighton at the Goldstone. Steve Moran scoring the first after 14 minutes. Just before half-time, Southampton put the tie beyond Brighton's reach with a well-worked second goal. Andy Townsend made the break and Glenn Cockrell was allowed to ghost through Albion's defence to make it 2-0. 
I mean, it was an exciting time, obviously, to get to progress in the FA Cup. Uh, and going back to Brighton, such an early stage after leaving, um, it's a difficult situation because you, you, you wish them to have a good game, but also you wish yourself to, to come out on top. And fortunately, on the day we did, and I think up to the day, Glenn Cockley played uh, particularly well. He scored a great goal. So um, coming back, you know, obviously a little bit of celebration and that, and we were forward into the next round. And then obviously Liverpool. I mean, anybody who's playing against them, it's a, it's a challenge in itself. And uh, with coming from there, originally born there, it's a little bit special in, in, in all respects. Case away, but only Wallace is up. And the tide of battle continues to flow Liverpool's way, but the score remains nil-nil. Now, -nil. Oh, oh, a terrible collision there, which might well have injured the arm, or the leg rather, of uh, Mark Wright, and Shilton's in a bit of trouble as well. That was the worst thing that could have happened to us. Um, it was a pure accident. I think Mark was sort of uh, racing for the ball with Craig Johnson and uh, in fact he was behind Craig Johnson and really didn't have any right to get there uh, but it, being Mark and the speed he's got and he's got very long legs he sort of got round between uh, Craig Johnson and myself and Craig Johnson sort of leant on Mark and, and pushed him onto me as I was coming out and, and um, we sort of all clashed together and I remember at the time hearing you know his legs snap and he, all credit to Mark, I mean, he showed a lot of character to come back from that. But the actual game itself, I thought we did exceptionally well, considering Liverpool were, were um, the best team in the country and easily the favourites for the game. Is stretched off. And Southampton for the moment down to ten men. Getting to that part of the game, of course, where exhaustion starts to take over and... The odd crucial mistake might well creep in. Mulby now trying to get beyond. Bond, and there was the mistake, and there was the goal by Rush. Oh, good run by Nicol. Oh, still going on. And another one by Rush. 2-0. That's it. The loss of Mark Wright and the loss of the game uh, didn't make it a particularly happy day, but we, we performed pretty well at, uh, on Spurs ground. and uh, I know uh, that they have, have good memories of that, so do I. Um, we also reached League Cup semi-final, um, drew Liverpool again, home and away. Um, at home, they did a classic job on us. They got a nil-nil, uh, a typical European role, and then, then away from home, we didn't have the strength to... Uh, uh, to last the, the game, so they, uh, they they did a thorough job on us that day, and all their uh, knowledge and expertise of, of many years in Europe came through. Despite losing that semi-final to Liverpool, the cup run had provided some excellent matches, such as the 4-1 demolition of Manchester United in a third-round replay at the Dell. In the second half, United were looking increasingly vulnerable, and some weak defending let in Wallace to put Southampton two up. And it was three after Letitia's lob beat Turner. By now, United were in total disarray. And from Casey's corner, it was the young man from the Channel Islands, Letitia, who made it four. That spectacular goal by Jimmy Case in the fourth round against Aston Villa was the first in a 2-1 win, with Colin Clark scoring the winner in the second half. Saints finished mid-table in the league that season, principally due to some splendid home performances, like the 2-0 defeat of Tottenham near the start of the season. Danny Wallace added to Colin Clark's opening goal with an unstoppable shot. That season, after suffering a serious pelvic injury, Nick Holmes left Saints after 14 years, having notched up more appearances than any other player, apart from Mick Shannon and Terry Payne. Nick Holmes doesn't very rarely get a mention, but when you look at Nick's, he devoted his life to this club. I remember Nick when he first came here as a youth player. He came from St Mary's College, straight to us from, from school, and he was with us all through, throughout his career. 
and uh, he, he was never, he was always an unassuming chap who did his best on the field, worked hard at the game and didn't, he didn't, uh, the lure of gold didn't affect him at all in this, uh, in this uh, climate we've got now where it's all about money. Steve Mills, Saints young fullback during the early 70s, whose promising career was cut short by a bad car accident, learned later that he was suffering from leukemia. Despite this, he courageously organized a fundraising match for cancer research, featuring many great former Saints who were only too pleased to help out for such a good cause. Lovely, lovely lad Steve Mills, great thing he's done, and uh, I'm sure like all the rest of the lads, I'm, I'm just proud to be a part of it. Steve was an extremely talented fullback who had already won an England under 23 cap. everything going for him. I, I played a few times um, in front of him at right, right uh, midfield and he was the fullback at the time, an up-and-coming kid and he just looked to have everything. Uh, so much pace, aggression and a super guy with it. There was no doubt about it, he was heading for a tremendous career in football and I mean what he did with bringing everybody uh, in the city together as he did just before um, unfortunately he died was absolutely out of this world. Tremendous man. The Steve Mills Charity Fund has so far raised more than £200,000 for the Wessex Cancer Unit, and that match alone attracted the largest crowd of the season at the Dell. The key word to describe Saints off the field activities would have to be stability three managers in 35 years and very few changes behind the scenes. I think every club, if you look at them, has a base behind it and I think Southampton Football Club has been particularly fortunate. It's had a board which has been very stable until very recent years when people have got older and the board has changed. And in addition to that, of course, we have had this tremendous stability with managers which we believe in. Uh, we've led to a continuation of management thought it doesn't change too much. You're not in the situation that every two or three years that you're changing everything in sight in the club. Chris, we had known as a player, we knew him for his character, his hard work, his honesty, his integrity. And we believed that if he was given the opportunity, he would come through as a, as a good manager. It's a longer policy than taking somebody who is done it before but then may not be with you for such a long period of time. We believe we have made um, a good choice and we support the manager wholeheartedly in his endeavours to make us a better first division side. It's a business and it's entertainment. It is extremely important. Without the money you don't have a football side. If you take a club such as Southampton which has a restricted ground capacity compared with Manchester United or Arsenal. It is obviously very important that we work doubly hard on the commercial side so that our income at least goes some way towards matching theirs. So I think it's tremendously important. My first involvement here was as a supporter for, for the early 60s uh, and over the last seven or eight years we've become involved here in, in supporting them financially uh, with sponsorship etc. Um, we're able to invite clients here um, from all over the country where they support their favourite teams and obviously local people that have an interest. And I think the, the general commercial activity of every football club, especially Southampton, is, is very important if we're to compete uh, with, with other clubs. Here's Dodd. There's his cross. A terrific, a terrific goal by Rideout. Still a Tissier. Might get a shot in here. No, plays it for Wallace instead. It's another goal! It was, it was a brilliant day. Um, the, the players came off at the end of the at the end of the game. We were just on cloud nine for the next week. It was it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, it was it was the best team performance that I've ever played in.
you really attacked them that day and you scored a great headed goal too didn't you yes rare occasion <laughs> i scored a header but um uh, the all-round team performance was was absolutely brilliant rodney had a great day everybody played played to their potential and, and we we hammered them and last season of course pfa young player of the year yes obviously uh, i've got to look to build on that now and uh, look to the future i'd just like to say that it was an honor to be nominated for this award in the first place but uh, to actually be named Young Player of the Year by my fellow professionals is a realisation of a dream for any young pro. Matthew's a genius. People might laugh when I say that, but he is. He has the ability to do things that other people haven't got. Uh, he's not a workaholic. I mean, there's times you watch him on the field and you feel like pulling your hair out. Uh, but 10 minutes of magic and he can win you the game. Uh, Rodney Wallace, Alan Shearer, uh, just to name some of them, Francis Benali. Um, they're good players, they've worked hard, players with talent, uh, but they've got other ingredients as well. I think the most important ingredient is mental toughness, um, to live and work at the top in, in professional sport. And uh, the other thing is the stability of the club, the framework from which we work within the club, from the boardroom right through the club. I think that's one of the most important ingredients where we work together as a family. And uh, we try to weed out the players as they come through, we looked for, for specific things, and those boys had those things we were looking for. Yeah, we've got we've got more than Matthew Letizia. Uh, Matt's a uh, slightly different case because he, he comes from Guernsey, and uh, when he first arrived here, he was a very young, shy boy and, and didn't open his mouth too much. But uh, that's changed a little bit. He has much more to say now. He, he has the confidence of uh, a season and a half that's been uh, very good. Um, he was our top scorer last year. Uh, Rodney Wallace was second, and Rodney also is a good player. We have other good players, other good young players who uh, who uh, follow in the tradition of uh, Shannon and, and Keegan and, and Charlie George, Peter Osgood. And they follow in those traditions, and they're, uh, uh, they've got to be uh, aim at the kind of standards that they had. And uh, Keegan, for instance, was magnificent on the pitch and off it. And, Hopefully that uh, that still stays within the club, that experience, and that these young lads can follow that and maybe even go on to better them. Entertainment is the name of the game here, isn't it, really? Uh, we try, yeah, we try for that. We like better results, as everybody would, but unless you're Liverpool, maybe it's tough to do. Um, <coughs> yeah, they're used to style here, and. and um, Obviously, with the, the kind of players we've just talked about and you've named, that uh, they are used to that kind. They're used to the skill. They're used to players, top-class players. They want to see uh, good football played. They want attractive football. They want to watch that. They want to see goals. Um, that's what they're brought up on, and we've, uh, we're trying our best to supply that. In the future, who knows? It's, uh, there'll be a lot of people there, and let's hope they go on and uh, become the Liverpool of the bloody year two from year 2000 on or something, or late 90s, who cares? <laughs>